it is your buddy peace and harmony with you here today much love going out to all the beautiful empowered harmonizers and we're zooming in and focusing in today on a br brilliant viewer question and that is to pr please look at and understand the role of envy or jealousy in the covert narcissist in someone who has a pathological sense of self-importance and coupled with a lack of empathy really how does this manifest or how does this present itself in the signs and red flags of this type of relationship dynamic so thank you for your great viewer question but before we get started i want to give a super huge shout out to those of you who have recently donated to the channel and stepped up thank you so much for reaching out and for your donations it's such a pleasure to hear from you and it makes me feel so good to know that the content that we are uh, creating and discussing and supporting here are making a difference that they're helping to be life-changing and helping you to get right back on track and see things and become much more keener and aware of the dynamics and heal through and work through the specifics in these very confusing, oftentimes bewildering and painful relationship dynamics and really where it sort of landed you in life. So thank you so much. It's so It makes it so wonderful and inspiring to hear from you. It really helps me to feel that I'm doing a good service here. So thank you so much. And absolutely positively, if the channel has been a positive resource, please do feel free to participate here. There is a PayPal Donate Now button on the About page here um, at Peace and Harmony. We would love to hear from you, so thank you so much. It keeps me revved up and excited. So we are going to zoom in and focus in on a very interesting and very fascinating aspect of a covert narcissist relationship, and that is that of envy, jealousy, not wanting someone to get further ahead in life than you, not wanting someone to do better than you, not wanting someone to get the win where all of a sudden there's a sense of winner and loser. There's always sort of this judgment or this dichotomy that, you know, if you excel beyond me, then you threaten my position. You threaten how I look. You threaten how I feel and you threaten my functioning. So when we are talking about a covert narcissist, someone who has a pathological sense of self-importance and has a uh, compulsive insatiable need to control and manipulate and have power over others, oftentimes the way that they're able to secure this place for themselves in relationships communities, their life, their inner circle, their inner sanctum, whatever, you know, circles that they find themselves in, oftentimes a component of that is keeping others in a less than or sabotaged position. They are the ultimate saboteurs. In other words, when you begin to, you know, inch forward or communicate or get what your needs satisfied so you can begin to really become empowered or do your best or get the job or feel happy or start to you know stumble upon your talents or stumble upon your happiness your fulfillment so when you begin to enter those chambers that space in life your happy space where you're really starting to accomplish things or when you're growing you know growing up as a child um, the covert narcissist unequivocally has a stance of jealousy they are envious over others in life, especially their inner circle, their inner sanctum, their inner community, so that if you would perhaps get strong enough to either leave or get space or, um, you know, be uh, have your wherewithal, um, you're going to see the manipula manipulation tactics of withdrawal, of withholding, of the not giving, not being supportive. So yes, that's a huge factor and very fascinatingly so in that the envy, which really means I'm not going to give you what you need, um, the time of day, in other words, to help elevate you because that would present a threat to my position in the relationship. So even this person 
um, because of who they are, or what they've been through. Um, you know, they might, they're in a position to love or support or encourage. Um, they are then going to be in the withholding. They're not going to give you the love. They're not going to show you the feedback. They're not going to show you the support. They're not going to give you the goods. They're not going to, you know, allow you to sort of, you know, dissect things or be there for you or allow you to feel good and happy in the relationship, i.e. empowered i.e. kind of, you know, at your best, um, knowing the things, the diff what I call the differentiators in life. It's like, you know, we have a lot of viewers who make comments here, you know, if only I had known this 20 years ago. So I'm going to call those differentiators, the things that make things clear to you. It is the differentiators. Um, it is the, the sense that now that I know this, I have the knowledge, or now that I know that I need to apply this, or now that I know I need to write this down, or now that I know that I need to make this simple, or now that I know I'm not the crazy one. It's sort of the, the fog that they keep you in is really a result of a, a sort of sabota saboteur uh, uh, positioning. So it is a way of gaslighting and keeping you in a, a less than position. And so the jealousy, as you can understand, so if they don't want their supply to leave, it's very much like the cat or mouse game. Um, the cat wants to take control and then have, you know, their fun in their, their one up position. So they, if they find a mouse, they're going to, you know, play with it and then battle, battle, you know, batter it down to the point where it's still kind of wiggling, but it won't sort of, you know, kill it. It'll keep it in a very, very, a debilitated state so they won't always kill it they'll kind of keep it in that suffering state and that gives the cat a chance to keep some sort of supply around but the cat then still gets to have the toy they still get to have the supply they still get to have their you know their predatory needs met so realize that the the covert narcissist very much will keep others in a trauma bond or a stranglehold in this fashion, in this manner. And oftentimes the root of it is sort of that pathological envy that if you were to leave, if you were to be strong enough, if you were to figure out what's going on, um, if you were to call them out, if you were to see things clearly, um, if you were to able to get the knowledge, if you were able to surround yourself with the people who could assist you, you know, if you were to have that foundation and have that within yourself, what is called self-esteem, which is that chronic undergirding I am okay state. There's nothing inherently wrong or flawed with me state. I, I deserve the best in life and I expect it to come to me state. So that is what we call self-esteem, self-evaluation. So it's a foundational B state. It's not a conditional state which is based on judgment. It's just an overall, you know, I am state. And so that is the go-to state which you need to discover and find and live within yourself on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, which is a permission base. So you need to enter into that state in a very relaxed body and allow that feel-good state to emanate. And oftentimes it's very heart-centered. It's very solar plexus-centered. So it's in sort of your abdomen, you know, in between your hip bones and up, and then your heart center. You know, the judgment, the analysis, paralysis comes from living too much in your head, trying to figure things out too much, trying to right the wrongs, trying to right the brainwashing, trying to right the judgment, um, trying to get out of the being controlled state, trying to get yourself out of being manipulated and feeling like you're severed in half, you're split in two, like a you know an oak quarter that you've just been you're you know you're you're like a, a a big tree trunk that an axe has just severed you in two and you're you know you feel that you know you're split in half um and you're still trying to feel whole so you you feel like an you know a, a quarter of oak that's just been axed um when you are constantly under the subtle manipulation of someone who wants to keep a leg up on you so you almost feel like you've got one head, one foot on your head, the other pulling your hair, you know, and you're still trying to get up. 
it's very hard to stand up when you have someone's legs on your head or on your shoulder trying to keep a, a leg up on you, i.e., that is an expression. Someone is trying to always keep a leg up on you. They're always trying to keep the I am better than you state. They're always trying to whisper things in your ear. Um, the little sweet nothings which enter you into the negative orderly direction thinking of thinking, feeling, and behaving. You're too noisy. You're too loud. You're too quiet. Um, you know, you're too happy. You're too excited. You're too down. I mean, all these little uh, sweet nothings of negative orderly direction thinking which have been whispered in your ear by the covert narcissist or imprinted on you deep within, the subconscious mind works like a camera. It quickly will take a picture of something which it feels is meaningful. So it's very important to understand the inner workings of what we got here. It's a very interesting and precarious position to be a human being. It really is an extraordinary experience because here you arrive you have all this sophisticated machinery within you, your feeling state, all the energy centers, all the intuition, all the divine intelligence, but yet you really don't have a manual with which to understand and not only sort it out within yourself, but critically your environment and understanding your environment. I mean, you know, the birds, you know, I mean, they're, they're kind of navigating, they have their own instinct, but we have a very, very complex position but namely it's to understand the inner workings within and then how the environment then triggers you to either reinforce and enter into a clarity or a fog or a negative state. And so it is very important to understand that the covert narcissist has set in, in especially in that subconscious mind, which is really, um, it's important to understand that your subconscious mind will, will take pictures of images of things which it holds to be meaningful. And by meaningful, meaning significant, meaning that which you are to, you know, gravitate to or remember or organize your feelings around, your thoughts, your decisions and choices. For example, you know, if you see a magnificent mansion on a beautiful lake, you know, your subconscious mind is going to take a picture of that and say, wow, that is iconic. That is magnificent. That is the good life. That person really has it all. They figured something out. They are, you know, they're, you know, so there's a lot of meaning tied to the images. So that's why we hear a picture is worth a thousand words. So it's important to understand the power of the subconscious and then how it plays and how it has a role to play in understanding the manifestation and how it's created and landed you where you are in when you've been in a relationship with a covert narcissist who is acting by envy and jealousy and really sort of that pathological sense of self-importance. So they don't want or not able to give you the knowledge, the looks, the positive, pleasant environment. Oftentimes the covert narcissist relationship will make or create an environment that is uh, discreetly unpleasant, i.e., you know, uh, there's a, a subtle tension, there's a subtle unhappiness, um, they're not very communicative, they're very withholding, retreative, they're always looking down, they're always looking away, they're always turned away from you. I mean, you, you can't, it's like you have to constantly knock on the door, you have to go out of your way, you have to then enter into a self-abandonment state, a self-deprivation state, what I call a self-asphyxiation or emotional asphyxiation state in order to attend to their needs. So it's a pathological sense of attention that they are also garnering from this. A pathological uh, need for attention and validation. So for example, let's look at a wonderful icon, Robin Williams. I mean, the guy is a genius. The guy is a complete prodigy. He was so hilarious, so funny. He could do so many things with his body and his movement and his dance and the different characters that he did. He was unequivocally a stunning individual who unfortunately passed um, due to his own demise. Now, there is an individual who has a need for attention. So I bring up this individual 
to show you that this is what someone who has a need for attention, what they look like. It is built into their hard wiring. I mean, this is who the guy is. And I'm not saying that he's narcissistic. I'm just saying this is what it looks like when someone has a need for, you know, attention. The class clown. I'm trying to give you some ideas so you can put meaning and you can understand the person who always needs to be the center of attention when you're talking to them. Everything is always about them. Me, 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 I, 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 my assessment, my assessment, my assessment, my opinion, my opinion, squash, 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 squash. You know, it is, that is what the dynamic looks like. It's like they're just, you know, extinguishing others' viewpoints, feelings, um, perspective, it is all, so this is how you begin then to feel worthless. So I want you to understand how the dynamic gets set up and then how you then begin to unconsciously abide by, acquiesce, or agree to this state. And then you begin to operate that internal sense is in that fight or flight. And then you then become codependent and sort of in need of this individual and you're acquiescing to this sense of jealousy. So then you're always feeling you're enter into the sap, the hands of the saboteur. You're, they are sabotaging you, um, you know, from the French sabbat, uh, to muddle or befuddle. It was an ancient term used, I believe in the 1500s French, which, which means to muddle an army. It originally has its, um, foundation in it's a very it's a military term so if you're gonna you know uh to the enemy um you're going to uh you know uh uh, uh muddle up or uh befuddle and confuse the enemy so uh sabat to muddle them up to you know their senses you know it's you know it's it's a military term it's very fascinating you can look it up but this is then where you see the sabotaging the withholding of attention the withholding of affection the withholding of communication. This is not asking too much. You need communication to live. You need to be able to exercise and live in this state where you're able to communicate and have eye contact, you know, if you, and, and have skin contact. If you don't have these, you will wither away. We're gonna wrap this up just because I see our tape is wrapping up here. But this is, I want you to um, understand the role that this plays and how to separate yourself from this demise and realize you're now exiting out of the brainwashing. Your buddy, peace and harmony with you here today. I hope that these videos do help. Please share and please subscribe for more great tools, videos, discussion, and support.